Welcome to church uh, here at First Church of God in Jeff City. Welcome to all of you who are in seed and welcome to all of you who are on Facebook. Uh, we hope that you would enjoy our service and let it be filling and wonderful to you as it is to all of us. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for today and we thank you for all that you've blessed us with. Lord, we pray that you would um, just bring your indwelling and your just life into this service. Lord, we pray that you would speak to all of us and allow us to be able to come closer to you. Lord, we love you and we thank you. Amen. Amen. Would you please stand and sing with us this morning? you've done for me. 
again for the announcements. Uh, I forgot to introduce myself this morning. I am Zach uh, Bolton. I am the interim uh, youth uh, young life coordinator. Ooh. And now I'm here to do the announcements for you guys. So first things first, there are new tithe envelopes and they're available in the lobby area. Uh, there's a coat drive for the SWECC, which I learned is the Southwest Early Childhood Center. Uh, the first service helped me figure what that out meant. And uh, what they're looking for is some gently or new, gently used or used, oh my goodness, gently used or new coats in sizes six to eight um, to be dropped off at the church lobby through the end of the month. And if you want more information, see the newsletter. Uh, this Wednesday, uh, we will be wrapping up the um, In His Image series. Um, and that'll be at 6.30, and um, afterwards, I would like to see the youth so that we can get um, to filling some holes and stuff like that for the uh, Youth Sunday that is on the 31st. So, if you're a youth and you do come, please stay afterwards, and we will, uh, we'll get everything situated and get everything ready so we can have a great service um, on January 29th and 30th is governance board training. Sign up at the Welcome Center. January 30th is team meeting from 9 a.m. until 1 p.m. And the last one is on January 31st is Youth Sunday. And that is it for the announcements. Thank you. Uh, just a couple of things. It is Bill Kaplan's birthday this coming Wednesday. It's Zach's birthday this coming Saturday and yesterday. Friday. Friday. Thank you. And yesterday was Yogi's birthday. So can we put all those together and celebrate and sing happy birthday? And when we come to the names, you just quickly put them all together. Okay, here we go. <laughs> 
Happy birthday. Happy birthday, dear. Happy birthday to you.
worship song. It's called Waymaker. Um, for probably the last year, year and a half, you've heard it on, on popular Christian music. And I believe this song has truly brought a tremendous amount of peace to current believers and also brought new Christians to the Lord. So I was praying the last couple days. <laughs> this song and a scripture that went with this song. And I wake up every morning and uh, read the daily verse, the verse of the day, which is on the Bible app. I'm sure several of you use that. So today's verse was very fitting. It's from 1 Peter 5, chapter 5, verse 10. But may, God, may the God of all grace, who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. So we'll sing the uh, the first verse through, and, or I will, and then I'm sure you guys have heard it, so you'll catch on pretty quick. Thank you. 
Father, we thank you this morning for always being present in our lives, for moving in our midst. Lord, it's so easy to get busy with life, to forget about the great works that you are doing each and every day for us. Father, I just pray right now over this service, Lord, that the words you bring through Pastor Joe and his message this morning may bless this congregation, Lord, and give us the courage to share what we know and share our love with you, Lord, with the rest of this world, with our neighbors, our friends, and even our family. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. to you this morning and it goes like this have you ever had an idea that has come into your mind and you thought how beautiful this thought will be so you tell it to some other people and you tell it to your boss and he says yeah let's let's put that into plan so as you see this plan just come to life it just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger and man you're thinking this is really good and all of a sudden you hear a disturbance over here and that disturbance goes to here and it goes to here and the next thing you know the whole plan that you had has vanished and it's in ruin I think sometimes about earth. The creation that Jesus Christ and his father made. And as Jesus looks down upon the earth and sees all the chaos and all all the stuff and the things that are going on in the world that he created with love and compassion for us. I feel it breaks his heart when he looks down upon what he has created. And then I think, Danny put that on a personal level. I think, Danny, what about your sin? The sin that's in life. And what if, and what if the sin in our lives creates the same pain in Jesus Christ's hands that the nails made? Does he still feel the pain of the nails? died for my transgression that he'd paid that price a long long time ago when he gave his life for me on a hill called Calvary but there's something else I want to know Does he still feel the nails every time I fail? Does he hear the crowd I crucify again? Am I called? 
seen him pain that I know Treat his precious grace so carelessly. But each time he forgives, what if he relives the agony he felt on that tree? Does he still feel the nail? Every time I fail, does he hear the crowd cry, crucify again? Am I causing him pain that I know I've got to change? I just can't bear the thought of hurting him. It is time for our children to be dismissed, to go downstairs, to be a part of kids' life. And we are so blessed uh, by our children and by the ministry that we have and can offer here during our 1030 service. I'd like for us to talk about some things here amongst us, including those of you that are on Facebook today. It is very true that our nation is extremely divided. We would be irresponsible and amiss not to talk about that. We also need to face the facts here. I, as the pastor, hear much dialogue from many of you. The church is divided too. There are some amongst us in the body of Christ that find it just shocking that we would vote for somebody. That's the truth. There are others who are shocked that others would vote for a certain platform. There are some that have the view that uh, some are religiousizing a particular uh, party. There are some that have the opinion that Christians should leave their religious faith away from politics in the church. So while our nation is extremely divided, it has crept into the church. And of all times for our nation to see a united people of God, it should be now. I can't fix that. You can't either. 
No political party can fix that. Only God can fix that. So we're going to humble ourselves today. It may take some a little bit of time, and it may take some time for us on Facebook, but it's crucial that the people of God pray and ask God to do a work in us that will help us. Uh, we're going to be having some calls this week. Uh, I am just because this is creeping across even the landscape of, of our faith. And I'm going to be talking to some leaders. They're talking to me. How can we have dialogue? We, we don't know how to have dialogue anymore. And if any group should know how to exchange ideas, not based on our experience, but based on truth of God's word, it should be us. It should be us. So if you can, physically, I'm going to ask that you would kneel there at your chair. If you're at home, you can kneel at your couch or kneel uh, at your chair. But if you can, I'm going to ask that we would humble ourselves before the Lord and before one another. And let's lift up our nation and the church of Jesus Christ. Father, we're coming to you today first as children of God. Those of us in this room, those of us on Facebook that have actually experienced the transforming power of the gospel in Jesus Christ, we are coming today as children of God bought by the blood of Christ. And we're coming in His merits and in His merits alone. And we're asking that you will do a work in us that we can't do in and of ourselves, God. In fact, the whole thing overwhelms us. And we pray that the Spirit of God would soften us as your people, humbling ourselves with each other and with you. That we might take our experiences and maybe uh, uh, cleanse them through what is true in the Word of God. And no matter how we do it, we pray that we might do it in the Spirit of love. So we come to you today on behalf of your people, the church, across this land, whether they meet in this corner or that corner. We pray for the, the, the bud, blood-bought Christians in America today, for us to be sober of mind and heart, that we might be people of prayer, of repentance, and to bring the church before you. So we come as children of God, but we also, also come, God, as Americans who love this land. We didn't choose to be born here, but we're grateful that we were born here. We're grateful that this is our home. We're grateful for the heritage of this nation. We're glad for the, the way of freedom that we have experienced, the way that it absolutely ignited and opened up the gospel to be preached here in so amazing ways, and then to go out to other nations because of the way that you worked in the framework of this nation through the gospel. We, we thank you for that. But God, we've so drifted. We don't even really know how far. And we're seeing the consequences and the fruit of it. And it frightens us. It concerns us. It does overwhelm us. We don't even know what is true and what is being told to us. If it's even true. So God, we're calling upon you that you would have mercy upon us as a people. That you would have mercy upon us in our nation, from our leaders all the way down to every family unit. We pray for the mercy and the grace of God to come upon us again. We pray for Donald Trump and Mike Pence who are leaving this week. 
We pray for them, for their families. We pray for Joe Biden and Kamala Harris and uh, the new administration and all that that will mean. We pray for them and lift them up. But God, we need a revival in us that will change the culture by the movement of God's Spirit. So to that end, we pray that today. In Jesus' name. And the people of God said together, Amen. Amen. You may take your seats. We're continuing today on this series looking into the parables of Jesus. So far, we've looked into the parables that deal with the kingdom of God the rule and the reign of God. Today, we're switching gears and we're going into some parables that talk about salvation. The, very, uh, the most prominent one, the most known one, of course, is the story of the prodigal son. We most of all know this story, but we're going to look at it today and ask God to teach us afresh and anew, some elements of truth. Will you, even on at home, will you listen with your heart as I read the simple words of Jesus as he tells this story? There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So his father divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired men have food to spare, and here I am starving to death? I will set out, I will go back to my father, and I will say, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. So he got up, and he went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring, or, ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Will you pray with me? We look to you today. Lord Jesus, with the story that you've given to us to teach us and to draw us to you, may it be so today, in Jesus' name, amen. The word prodigal actually means wasteful, 
wasteful. This is known as the parable of the prodigal son, but it is also, in the past, has been known as the parable of the loving father. In this story, we see some elements that are really crucial for us to look at clearly today. The very first one is this, that in this story, we find, particularly in the heart of the son, that there is what is known as rebellion. There is rebelliousness. This is actually the third parable that Jesus told on the theme of salvation. The first one, of course, is the lost sheep. The second one is the lost coin. This third one is the lost son. Truth be known, the, 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 the sheep is lost because of foolishness. The coin is lost because of carelessness. But the son is lost because of a choice, because of rebelliousness. You see, Jewish law always said that the older son, which is, I'm, how many of you are first born in this room? We got double what the others got. That's based in Deuteronomy chapter 21, by the way. The father also could divide his estate anytime he wanted to. He could do it while he was alive, or he could wait until he was dead. But it was his choice. He was to be the one to even bring it to the table for discussion. So we find this younger son, not the older one, the younger one, coming and saying, hey, father, listen, I'd like to have my share now. I would like to have my share now. Now, in that day, that would be just be unheard of. It's almost as if the son is saying to the father, I kind of wish that you were dead so that we can move on with this because I'm ready to get my share of this estate of yours. So the father, the father divides his, in his estate amongst his two sons. Little does the son know that trouble is going to be coming to him. Uh, all of us, if we're really truthful, are, are aware that trouble does come when we begin to seek fulfillment in things, all the while forgetting our relationships. And we find that this son uh, gets his estate and he gets his, his, his inheritance and off he goes. And the story says he goes off to a far off country. That's important for you to think through. A far off country. Now today, if we go to a far off country, we've got cell phones, WhatsApp, what apps and all that kind of stuff that we can FaceTime and communicate with. They didn't have any of that. They didn't even have the U.S. mail. So to go off to a far-off country, that was like saying, shh, this relationship is over. There's not going to be any more communications. Adios. I'm out of here, Dad. Bye. And he goes off to a far-off country, and there he squanders. He wastes all that his father has given to him. He wasted on wild living and you can just fill in the blank, whatever that might be, whatever that might look like. And something happens. A famine comes. How many of you have ever experienced a famine in your life? Oh, no, 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 I'm not talking about you've not had enough to eat. I'm talking about, you know, the spiritual famines that come to us, the emotional famines the relationship famines, sometimes they just come out of the blue. We didn't even see them coming. Famines. And here's what happens. Uh, th th this, this son, he's gone off to a far-off country. He, he's taken all of his wealth. He's squandering it, and, and, and he's looking for some things. And, and, and what he's looking for, he's, he finds the very opposite he finds the very opposite. He, he looks for pleasure only then to experience what? Pain. He, he, he looks for companionship only to be lonely. He looks for freedom 
only to find enslavement. He, he, seeks to find, he seeks to find being filled, but he fills and finds himself empty. He seeks to find the life, and he experiences a death. Oh, no, no, not physically, but in all that he thought, his dreams, his plans, his hopes, they're gone. And he finds himself, of all places, in a pig pen. Now, that kind of goes over us because we're kind of friendly here in the United States with pigs. We love bacon, pork. How many of you are with me? They were not like that in Jesus' day. They were not. Pigs were like considered really unclean. They were not allowed to touch them, let alone eat them. It was forbidden in the Old Testament. God said that that animal is unclean for you. And so for this man to be in a pig pen, for this man to be actually longing to eat that which the pigs would eat was just like, whoa, shocking. I mean, it drew the people in. It'd be like you and I today getting our food into a dumpster in an alley from a restaurant that people had already touched. He finds himself, and and what's so interesting is, isn't this the case? This is where he never planned on going. This was not in his plans at all. This was not on his to-do list, and he finds himself in the pig pen. And an amazing thing happens. The story says, and he came to his senses. Somehow, a light came on. And he's going, my, my, my father's servants, they have food to eat and food to spare, and here I am starving half to death. Did you get that? It wasn't only that this, that this man saw what he had done. It wasn't only that he had experienced his guilt, his shame, his loss. It wasn't only that his eyes were open for the very first time at what he had done and where he was. Did you get it? His eyes were open. There was a remembrance of not how terrible he'd been, but how good his father was. My father is so good that even his hired servants have been blessed by my father's goodness. And what this does, it leads us to the next point, and that is repentance. You have the rebellion, but now you have the repentance. The repentance, remember, repentance isn't feeling sorry. How many of you have ever felt sorry for something, but you've not changed? Oh, yes. Repentance is the changing of one's mind about something. This young boy, he, he, he saw his situation, but he changed his mind about his situation. He changed his mind about his father. He changed his mind, and, and, and did you get what he did? He put action behind the changing of his mind. It was true. He did remember the goodness of his father. And let me just tell you, my friend, you think back about where you were, the pig pens that you were in, the pods that you wanted to eat. The guilt, the shame. It was not, it it was the goodness of God that brought you to himself. Not the judgment of God, the goodness of God. That God is so good and compassionate. And this is what this young man in a state of repentance did. And did you get what he did? He, he, here he is in the pig pen, and he says some very important words. You cannot miss it. I will arise. I'm not going to let anybody come and help me out of this pig pen. 
I'm not going to help. I'm not going to have my dad. I'm not going to wait till somebody comes and helps me, whether it's the neighbor, whether it's the government, whether it's, whether it's my dad. I will arise. I got myself into this. I will arise and I will go to my father and I will say to my father, he owned it. He owned it. And he puts action. I will arise and I will go to my father and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against you. I have sinned against you. He, he, he recognized, he acknowledged his situation and there was a spirit of repentance. You see, when we talk about the church repenting, the church, you and I, we have to change our minds about some things. Now that's just thrown in there. That just came to me. I didn't even say that the first service. We talk about all these things. We pray about all these. But we've got to do some changing that God's got to do in our lives. And this, this man who was filled with rebellion, did his own thing, and found himself in a pig pen, repents. And he arises, I will go to my Father. You have in this story rebelliousness. You have in this story repentance. And then you have in this story rejoicing. Rejoicing. He gets up and he goes to his father. Now, the story here makes a dramatic change because now the story is no longer focusing on the rebellious son. The focus now becomes upon the father. Let's talk about him, okay? Do you see him? Do you? Do you see him sitting at the empty dinner table, the empty spot where the son used to occupy? Do you see him tossing and turning in the middle of the night thinking, where is my son? What is he going through? What, what, what's happening to him? Uh, whoa, whoa, whoa. Do you see him going down the hallway and looking at the empty bedroom? Do you feel that kind of longing? I mean, many of you are parents. Do you see the days, the days that he gets up and he has enough courage, he has enough wherewithal? I mean, he can't already keep himself from doing it. He goes to the window and he moves the, he, he, he moves the, the curtain just enough day in and day out and day in and day out to think, is today the day he's going to come home? Do you see that? Do you see that, that fateful day when he comes? Do you hear him almost catch his breath? <gasps> is, is that him? And then when he realizes that it's him, he runs towards his son. He runs for him. My friend, this was so shocking in Jesus' day. First of all, men who were old enough to be fathers of grown sons, they did not run anywhere because it was considered a lack of self-control and discipline and a lack of dignity. For this father to run to his son was just so like, what? And he runs to his son. His son then begins to, to, to confess, Father, I've sinned against you. I mean, the father doesn't even hardly wait for it to be over. He embraces his son. He kisses his son. He gives a commandment to the servants. Quick, bring the best robe. Get a ring. Get some sandals. Get the best sandals. Put it on him. And that fatted calf that we have out in the back, wow, the time has come. Kill that sucker. We're going to have a party. Did you get it? Who owns the best robe? 
The Father does. Who do you think wore the best robe? The Father. Who do you think has the best who do you think has the best sandals? The Father. And he comes and says, Put what I have. Put the best of what I have. Put it on him. For this son of mine was lost and is found. He was dead, but I have him back. We're, 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 going to, we're going to celebrate. You have no clue how that was revolutionary to the people that Jesus was speaking to, who had this concept that God was a God of judgment and law and harshness. This totally like, for the first time, showed who God and what he was like towards them. You see, in Jewish law, the son was supposed to have been stoned to death. He had bucked his dad. He had put his, he, he had put his nose up. And he had taken his estate. He had squandered it. He had brought a bad reproach on his father's name. He deserved to be stoned. And instead of having a funeral, they had a feast. Wow. If you're a Christian today, if you've come to Christ, you at one time were the prodigal. You were. Away from God, squandering what God had given to you, doing your own thing, finding yourselves in more ways than one, here and there and everywhere, finding yourself in the pig pen, longing for things that uh, normally you would have never longed for. And by God's goodness, a light came on in your life. And you found your way back to the Father. And if you're really honest, if you get some of, the, if you get some of your false impressions of God peeled out of the way, uh, you will look back and see, God ran to me. He did. Maybe you're here and you've never come. You've never come and said, Father, I have sinned against you. Maybe you're still thinking God's going to really like be mad at me. You see, we all come from brokenness. We've got some broken issues in our family that have so tainted our view of God. Maybe you've stayed away because you just think, oh, this young man... He saw the goodness of God. And what's so amazing is he was saying, man, maybe I can be one of the servants. A servant does not wear the best robe. A servant does not wear the ring. A servant doesn't have the best sandals. And a servant, the fatted calf is not killed for. But for a son, it is. Thirdly and lastly, maybe you're here as a Christian been walking with the Lord. And the truth is known. Your own children and grandchildren are prodigals. You did the best you could. This father in the story is a perfect father. Yet his son chose to leave. God is the perfect father in the story of Adam and Eve, and yet they chose to leave. Maybe it's your grandchild, your granddaughter, your grandson, and they're out there, and they don't even know that they're even out in a wild, uh, far-off country. Maybe the famine hasn't even come to their life. Maybe the famine has come, and they're not even really recognizing it yet. Maybe they haven't got to that point of realizing that they're at the bottom. Our word, God's word, is don't give up. In closing today, we're going to watch a modern day version of this story. I came across it 
eight or nine years ago. I've showed it here once before. But it's so fitting with this. Afterwards, we're going to have prayer for our prodigals in our lives. But watch this video with your heart as we see this story unfolded in a dramatic way. God bless you.
Our Father, we're so grateful for this story. It so clearly shows us in the story. And it so clearly shows you. We are grateful for your compassion and your tender mercy towards us. Thank you for running towards us. And even before that, for demonstrating and showing the goodness that you have towards us. It brought us back to you. Help us not to lose sight of that. And we pray this in Jesus' name, who really became the lost prodigal for us all. Amen. I'm going to ask us today, if you have a prodigal son or daughter, If you have a prodigal granddaughter or grandson, I'm going to ask that you come forward. You can stay together as husband and wife or as a family unit, and you can kind of space yourself out. But listen, my friend, we've said this a hundred times in the prayer meeting. If you know Christ, it's because someone prayed for you. So we're going to spend some time praying for some prodigals. God knows how to visit Can we say amen? Will you come together? Charles is just going to minister to us as he plays. But make your way up here. And then I want you to just kind of, you can pray there at on Facebook, there at your home. You can just begin praying for your lost family members and that God would just, this is crucial for us. This is why we're here, is to pray and to touch God and to see people come to know him. So let's pray. Would you guys right here uh, at the altar just pray with each other? If you're alone, just begin to intercede and lift up your prodigals in your life to God. Our Father, we bring to you the sons and the daughters, the granddaughters and the grandsons that are represented in this room and on Facebook today that are out there lost away from you, squandering their precious life and days away from you. We pray for you to bring to mind the goodness of God that they have seen, experienced, and even tasted in their past. And that that goodness, like it did to us, would draw them back home to you. May we, as we pray for them, may we by faith look to the day that they... We see them coming. We see changes. We get a text. We get a phone call of some sort that you're working in their life and they've come home to the Father. We pray this in Jesus' name. And everyone said together, Amen. Let's sing that chorus that Charles is praying. Sing it together. Amazing grace how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. If this is your testimony, sing it out. I once was lost, but now I am found, was blind, 
but now I see. Amen. Amen. God bless you. You guys can find your way back to your seats. Lord willing, we're going to visit this story again in three weeks. Next Sunday, we have the privilege of hearing Brother Zach. He's going to be leading us in the Word of God that God's working on his heart. I'm going to be leading in worship. In two weeks, Brother Bob Moss, who's leading our governance training, will be our guest speaker for the day. But in three weeks, we will, Lord willing, visit this story again. Because we haven't finished the parable. We haven't talked about the older brother. And there's much for us to learn from him as well. Don't forget to come this Wednesday night as we continue into uh, this wrapping up of In His Image, the video series. It's going to leave us a little bit more time for some questions and answer. But that will be this Wednesday at 6 30. Let me just also say thank you so much for those of you that have joined us today on our Facebook page. We count it a joy and a privilege to minister to you. Join us again, Lord willing, next Sunday at 1030 here on our Facebook page. God bless you. Let me just clarify on the governance board training. It's technically not a governance board training.